Thank you for coming back so promptly. Uh, the, we're in the, the, the downhill stretch now. This is the final um, uh, session. We'll have three speakers, and then we'll have a question and answer uh, session, and then we're going to have uh, a panel discussion. A couple of new speakers um, on that panel. I will introduce uh, those uh, when we uh, get there. And some of the questions that hopefully you will uh, uh, pitch at us, I'll make sure that are uh, addressed by the panelists in the final session. Um, I have to say, having dreaded this event in many ways, I, I've said to a number of you, um, uh, I'd, I'd said for years that no organization I, I uh, have been involved in should ever organize a conference. Um, it's just not what we should be doing. Uh, I just kept wondering, why have we uh, uh, found ourselves in this uh, whole uh, process? We've been immensely uh, privileged with uh, team dynamics and with all of the partners who've uh, helped us. But th there are some invisible people here. And I just wanted to thank James and Michelle, who've been doing the scribing uh, for us during the process. A number of you have commented on uh, how interesting that um, ha has, has been. And at, right at the end, I want David Christie of Innovation Arts and, and the Value Web just to come up very briefly and show you uh, the website and, and, and just say a little bit about how some of this content uh, will be um, uh, uh, posted uh, there over time. And again, quite a number of people have been asking time scales. Some of it will be up in a few days, some, some, some of it will take a little bit longer. That, what, what a frustrating end to the last session. I mean, Isabel, uh, just as she was getting into a flow and we were beginning to um, uh, get into the, oh yes, and there's China, uh, a story, uh, we had to cut that off. Uh, but uh, and one of the things I think, again, people have been commenting on is how uh, uh, interesting they found it to have these uh, different sort of potted uh, presentations. But it does lead to immense uh, frustration uh, for those who'd like to know more. But anyone who wants to be connected after the event to people that you haven't already met here, we, with their permission, will be delighted to uh, provide their contact details. Um, the next three presentations are linked, I think, and I, they're, they're, they're linked in my mind this way. You know that uh, very recently the human species crossed over uh, that um, threshold uh, to the point where we're now uh, over 50% uh, concentrated in cities uh, and urban areas. Uh, and within not many decades, people are talking about perhaps as many as 70% uh, of, of our population globally. Uh, being in cities and urban areas. And there are some people who see that as a catastrophe. I was, I was trained as a city planner. I saw cities as cancers, uh, in a way. Um, I changed <laughs> over a period of time. And I think uh, many people are beginning to see cities not just as affording lower electricity, carbon, water, whatever, uh, footprints, but of being incubators uh, of, of uh, innovation uh, for the future. And our first speaker, Terry Wills, is Director of Global Initiatives uh, at C40. She tells me this, is, this is, uh, was originally 40 cities um, that came together to drive uh, through the uh, Clinton uh, Climate Initiative um, a range of, 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 of projects um, around carbon reduction and so on, although it's uh, subsequently opened up. But I'm told uh, that it's now 59 uh, cities. We'll hear about that uh, in, in a moment. But, City is absolutely fundamental. Then we'll hear from uh, Ian Yollis. Uh, many of you will know of him. You'll know of them. Recycle Bank, uh, based in New York, um, uh, basically interested in behavior change and the use of incentives to get ordinary citizens to change their behaviors in areas like uh, energy, uh, waste, uh, and transport. And some of you will know that um, Recycle Bank recently released an app iPhone app uh, in, uh, 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 jointly with uh, Transport for London ahead of the Olympics uh, to get people off the tube in, in moments or areas of uh, congestion. He may well tell you a little bit uh, about that. And then finally, uh, David Porter of Apposite Capital is going to talk about uh, the healthcare future. I, there, there, there are a number of people in the audience who um, uh, are uh, very much involved in the health space. I see Sophia Tekel among others. Uh, here we heard uh, from Paul Ellingstadt from AP, HP uh, earlier on. But, but what, what Dave is going to talk about in particular uh, is some of the systemic issues around healthcare, and particularly with aging 
uh, populations. So, th so those are the three speakers. Terry, if I could ask you to join me uh, on the stage, and then, if I may, I will hand over to you. Do you need a, a, a clicker? or? I think we have one here. It's yes, yours. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, I was a bit disappointed that you revealed our misnomer because I usually try and test audiences to see how long they notice that the number of cities we have in the C40 doesn't quite match the name. So um, what, what John didn't mention uh, in his introduction is that um, I'm afraid that this is going to be the slightly boring presentation relative to some of the other fantastic ones we've heard today. And that's because I'm going to have to talk a little bit about city bureaucracy and regulations and policy and how difficult sometimes it is to get things done in cities. But I think the reason why I was asked to come and speak today is that it's, it's maybe boring, some of this, but cities are really important and they can be incubators. They're not always incubators. They should be incubators. And what we're trying to do with the C40 is really find out the best ways to encourage cities to all be incubators and to share that information with one another and to really um, encourage one another to do more in terms of innovation. So that's what I'm going to talk to you guys today about. C40 cities, who are we? You already know that we're, we're 58 cities, 59. There's a 59th just added. We have professional staff in about 50 countries around the world. We have a lot of staff that are embedded within city halls um, in our C40 cities around the world. We have offices here in London, Los Angeles, and New York. It's uh, quite difficult for time zones, phone calls, that kind of thing. Um, our chair is New York City Mayor Bloomberg. We have a 10-member city steering committee. London is a part of the steering committee. And we have regional representation. The map is kind of hard to read, but we have major cities that are represented globally, so regionally represented. Um, our history, the reason that we're called C40 in partnership with Clinton Climate Initiative is because we've had quite an interesting history with the two organizations. Back in 2005, the London mayor at the time founded what was then called the C20. He was very passionate about climate change and felt very strongly that cities should really be working together to combat climate change. They should be sharing best practice. They should be acting collectively. Um, so he approached President Clinton, who at the time was starting up the Clinton Climate Initiative and had expressed an interest in participating and trying to solve the issue of climate change. And he said, I could really use some help with this thing called the C20. I'm thinking through what this might look like. And Clinton said, that sounds great. We'd love to help out, but why stop at 20? Why not make it 40? Why not make it more? So Clinton helped out. A C40 membership and governance structure was established in 2007. And then last year, really exciting, in April 2011, Clinton and the new chair of, of the C40, Bloomberg, announced the integration of what were then, what were previously two separate organizations, so coming together. And then we're working on an integrated planning process for delivering a new strategy, which I'll get into. So why do we care about cities? Well, more than half of the world's population lives in cities, which occupy 2% of the world's land mass, but create more than two-thirds of all CO2 emissions. And that's why we care. It's really important to combat climate change in cities. Otherwise, we're not going to make an impact in mitigating climate change. Now. So why aren't we doing more? I mean, if you look at this slide back here, cities still look like this. So we know that we have to combat climate change in cities, but you still have gridlock like this. You still, we are not moving the needle as much as we'd like to. Well, my belief is that technical solutions are available. Here are some pictures. We have LED street lighting. We have a voltage optimizer. We have um, charge points for electric vehicles. The technical solutions are there. What's complicated is the system. System complexity can slow take up in cities. Now, I don't know if any of you recognize this chart, this, this map, but it's basically the London boroughs. We have a bit of blue, we have a bit of red, we have a bit of orange. Each 32 boroughs has an elected council. Each borough has a very different way of procuring technologies like the ones we just saw on the previous slide. It makes life really, really difficult to scale something up across the city. So the system itself is really, really challenging. A case in point, one of my favorites is London streetlights. Probably don't think about streetlights very often. I never did before I started with CCI and C40. When I started the rule about two years ago, the deputy mayor said to me, why aren't we doing more with street lighting? We look at Los Angeles, they've done this amazing LED project across the city, and why can't we do that in London? So I started looking into it because the opportunity was significant. This chart says it all. 40% reduction in one borough from street lighting energy could reduce as much CO2 as removing 343 cars off the road. So why aren't we doing more? Well, if you go back to the previous 
map. This is why. Each borough has their own street lighting engineer. Each one has their own way of procuring street lights. So if you're an LED manufacturer, you say, I want to innovate. I've got this amazing product, but you can't get it sold across the boroughs because of this structure, which makes life really challenging. So what we've been doing at C40 is really trying to understand when do cities have the powers to be able to implement something and when don't they? John had asked me whether I could do a, a bit of a ranking and be able to articulate whether where does London sit relative to other cities around the world? And I said, well, I, I can't really do that because cities aren't going to be very happy with me if I say, you know, London gets a six and New York gets a five, and you know, that gets tricky. But what we have been doing is trying to understand what are the complexities, what, are the, what is the context that our cities are working within, and then how are they doing in the context of, of their powers and policies. So you can see here on this chart, what we took a look at is in London, what are they in a position to be able to do? Thinking about their borough structure, the power of mayors. They can set vision for everything. In some capacities, they have budgetary and revenue control. In others, they, have, they can set and enforce policies. They can also own and operate. But the difference, the nuances between what they're able to do can really impact the scale of what's achievable. So I'll take two examples really quickly. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side, the own and operate public buildings is a slightly darker color. That means they have slightly more power in public buildings than they do in private buildings. And I'll show you what they've been able to do because of that, the constraints within their powers and policies. London in the public sector has been doing some great work. So in 2007, President Clinton challenged C40 cities to commit to retrofitting public sector buildings. London led and developed something that's called refit. Basically what the mayor did was he volunteered the three agencies that he has complete power over. Those are the London Fire Brigade, Met Police, and Transport for London. And he put forward 42 buildings and said, why don't we retrofit these? These are in my gift to do, um, and let's prove a model. Let's show that this can be done. So 42 buildings were retrofitted, 7,000 tons per annum of CO2 saved, 7 million pound upfront investment, and 1 million pounds per annum in savings achieved. So this really showed what, what can be done if you have the power to do it. So when we compare the public sector relative to other cities, we see that London is actually doing really, really well. So they're up at the top number of cities that are um, implementing energy efficiency retrofits really far ahead. When we look back at the powers and policies, look again at private buildings. Slightly lighter shade of blue, not as much power in owning and operating. So what does that mean? Well, when we took it, take a look at private sector retrofits, we, can, we have to divide it up between cities that have powers and cities that don't. And what have cities been able to achieve with powers and without? And then how does London compare in these situations? Cities with powers, Melbourne, Los Angeles, New York, Tokyo as well, they have set regulation. They have said these buildings must be more energy efficient in the private sector. This this is required. In cities that don't have the powers, they can't say that. They can't enforce this. London's one of those cities. So some of the cities have taken an approach where they actually, it's a bit of like a Weight Watchers idea, where you get buildings to stand up and say, OK, this is how much uh, energy I'm using, and I'm committing to reduce a certain amount of energy per year. And they make commitments to the mayors, and they do these kinds of things. You don't have to to have powers to be able to do these kinds of programs. London is taking a slightly different approach and looking at toolkits and lobbying through the Better Buildings Partnership. So we have to compare London's success relative to what their powers are, but relative to other cities without powers and what they've been achieving. And so when we look at C40's, C40 cities, commercial buildings, well, you can understand then where London sits, that you know, they're, they're doing some work in energy efficiency retrofitting, um, but maybe not as much as other cities. So again, it's about the context and the system that they're working within. So then what is C40 doing about this? Well, what we've understood is that by looking at the cities and what powers they have, and maybe sometimes what powers they don't have, we need to match these cities and get them working together. So we're working on what we're calling the network approach. And this is a slide that was put together by one of our cities, Rotterdam, who has taken an approach by developing a network of cities that are delta cities, that are at extreme risk in climate change because of their position close to rivers, and that they have an increased risk from climate change, the rising of sea levels. So they've gotten together with a number of cities you wouldn't even think would be working together. Ho Chi Minh City working with Rotterdam. You have Jakarta, Tokyo. These cities get together and they're working together on a regular basis to solve some of these problems. And really, if you have one city that has done something really innovative, it can be transferred to another. And we see this as a really, really important way to drive innovation within cities. So we're refocusing our approach and our strategy around the network approach. We're developing, we're providing direct assistance to cities through these networks, research and knowledge management, and peer-to-peer -peer exchange, so to really drive innovation by that sharing of knowledge. 
A lot of the, the network approach is at the staff level. A lot of the work that we've been doing with things like street lighting, building retrofit at this, the staff level. But what's really important also is to engage at the highest level with the mayors. Um, if you take the Weight Watchers analogy, you get a bunch of mayors standing up on stage maybe once a year, once every two years, and speaking about what they've been doing in their cities. And of course, they're going to say all these great things that they're doing. But when they stand next to another city that maybe has done slightly more in an area where they kind of know maybe they should have been doing some Thing. It's amazing how much that can galvanize action, that if our mayor stands next to another mayor, they go back to their office and they say, we need to do more because these other cities are doing more, so let's do that. So for us, we see it really important to engage at the highest levels, but also at the staff level. So we, because of that, we're restructuring around these initiatives and networks, working with the mayors, but also at the staff level. And so just in conclusion, what, what relevance does this have for breakthrough innovation? Well, from my perspective, after having worked on things like street lighting, where you have this really frustrating system, but where we have made progress, it's really important to recognize that we must work within the system that we've got, because we're not going to change that system overnight. If we don't do anything, we're not going to make any progress whatsoever. So it's important to work within the system while also trying to change it. So we can work with the staff level in cities to really move the needle in certain areas, but also go to the highest levels and say, let's really take a fundamental look at what we're doing and try to change it, even though we, we know it might take some time. But it's really important to do both. And with that, I'll leave you. Thank you. Thank you.